Okay, hello English language A-level first year students. Um, I'm recording this lecture partly because um, I didn't give you the slides in class today and also so you can revise from it in future. Okay, so we are moving from talking about representation to talking about gender lect. Uh, both these issues can be talked about under language and gender, but for language and diversity, we're really interested in the, this, what we're going to be talking about now, gender lect. Okay, so under gender lect, we're looking at how far gender may affect people's language use. So we're going to look at a lot of, we're going to be talking about conversational style. So if you want to remind yourself of um, discourse, uh, spoken mode, which we did in the first term, excuse me, uh, and some of the ways we analyse conversation, that would be a good idea. Uh, we're going to get used to these, I, these terms, uh, dominant, dominance, deficit, difference. We're also going to mention diversity. Those are different ways of thinking about how men and women uh, use conversational styles differently. Uh, we'll also talk about lexical choices, whether there's a difference there between men and women, whether there's a pragmatic difference at levels of politeness, uh, and we may or may not talk about gender identity. OK, so these were the questions we started with in class, so I won't go over them again. We may return to them when we've finished talking about gender lect um, and be able to answer a bit more uh, with the evidence and things like that. OK, so we're going to start with differences between men and women's speech um, in terms of its sound. So we're going to talk about phonological differences. Um, and we're going to start with things about pitch, which is how high or low a voice is, and intonation, which is about how much it rises and falls, and also how much stress is made. And here, there are clear differences. Uh, mostly, usually, listeners can correctly identify gender uh, from the sound of a voice. And there are some biological differences that can explain this. Uh, for example, men have a larger Adam's apple, this bit in your throat, um, and longer vocal cords. It's vocal cords vibrating um, that make your sound, air passing over them. And there is um, an average, and if you look at the typical frequency, there's about 100 hertz difference between the female and the male. I think that's how fast they vibrate. I wouldn't like to swear to it, but you can see there's more for women, which makes the pitch higher. OK, but there are also cultural explanations for why um, possibly men and women um, have different sounding voices. So um, Gradol and Swan in 1983 found that women use a wider range of pitch. So they go up and down, higher and lower within their pitch. And also, greater intonational dynamism, which is a great expression, uh, just meaning more use of different tone to stress or unstress things. Um, also, they found that men used only the lower part of their pitch range. So it's not just what pitch is available to men, it's also which part of their, their pitch they're using. And the idea is that men are consciously or otherwise using a deeper voice they do actually have a higher level available to them they choose not to use which suggests there is some gender performativity involved not just biology i.e women learn to sound like women men learn to sound like men um, so it's interesting to consider how much of this is nature i.e biological difference and how much of this is nurture i.e social and cultural expectations of femininity and masculinity um, and people have looked at just this so there's an australian study in 1998 um, looking at whether the pitch of women's voices has changed as women's roles and women's um, equality has changed so um, voices were compared the same age of women, women between 8 and 25, and they were compared to women from 1945 and from the 1990s. And what the study found was that the fundamental frequency of the women's voices had dropped lower over five decades, 23 hertz lower, which they found was a significant audible difference. Uh, and they speculated as to why this could have happened. Um, and it could be because women are now in more prominent roles in society. 
uh, and that women consciously or unconsciously um, are adopting a deeper tone because that is what we associate with authority uh, and dominance. Um, and just as a side note, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was and um, yeah, was Britain's first female prime minister, um, she had voice training. Uh, part of that was to, I think, probably lose a bit of her accent, but a lot of it was about lowering her voice. Um, and it says something about our women's voice is not acceptable in positions of power. And when you think about some of the negative words associated with high pitched voices, that women are screechy, um, that you can see that, you know, this it may or may not be an equality thing that women's voices are getting deeper. <laughs> but there you go. Um, and then just to remind ourselves, there are differences in accent, which Trudgell found um, when we looked at action, when we looked at social group, we noticed there were not just differences due to class, but also differences due to gender. So Trudgell found there was a lower frequency of non-standard pronunciation in women than men of the same class. So all of the variables gender did seem to make a difference and it seemed to suggest men had stronger regional accents than women. Also, when the people in his study were asked what they thought their accent was like, women overreported their actual use of RP. That's the received pronunciation, the standard prestige form. And men did the opposite. They underreported it. So Trudgill suggested this was due to women being more status conscious, um, and particularly for what was overt prestige, the prestige that comes from the standard form. Now, that was in 1972, so that's a long time ago. Um, Milroy's Belfast study found in some cases that difference was reversed, and the place where that was reversed was where the men were unemployed and the women in work. So that allowed her to slightly change what Trudgell had argued, uh, and she suggested it's the density of social network rather than some sort of feminine attitudes um, that explain the difference in accent. OK, but mostly what we're going to be studying is uh, women and men's talk, um, how they speak, what kind of language they use. And we'll look a lot at the differences between, if there are any, <laughs> how men and women um, like to engage in conversation. And there are four main models that we are going to talk about. And these are listed in the chronological order in which these studies were published. So the first um, way of talking about gendered language, gendered spoken language, uh, it, we now call a deficit approach. Um, and the lady who produced, the woman who produced this work, uh, was looking at how women's speech could contribute to their lack of power and status in society. Okay, um, And afterwards, this got called a deficit approach, which is a criticism because what that's saying is this study looks at women as, as what they lack and that women somehow are deficient. Um, this was countered by a new way of looking at the difference in men and women's conversational styles and particularly the issue of why men seemed to uh, have more power and authority when they spoke. Um, and these studies we now call dominance studies. And they were much more interested. They didn't want to look at women's speech so much. Uh, they were interested in how men's speech style, particularly in mixed gender conversation, leads them to dominate women in conversation. That hence dominance. And then a little later on, that study was um, questioned by theorists who were more interested in uh, the idea that men and women have completely different styles of conversation. Um, so these studies just looked, looked far more at single gender talk, looked at women talking with women and men talking with men. And they looked at the genders as if they are distinctive subcultures. Uh, with, with completely different styles of talking. And it's this which leads to miscommunication. So they're saying men don't dominate women. It's just that men and women have a different way of talking, which leads to men dominating women. Um, and then finally, in the 2000s, we've now got this argument for diversity, which focuses on the differences within male and female speech. 
and the diversity approach disputes whether gender has a major effect on language use at all. Um, so why it's called diversity is because it wants to say the other aspects of things we talk about, like social class, like region, like age, like profession, have far more effect. The effect of gender is minimal compared to those things. And that two different women, two women will talk very, very differently from each other, despite the fact that they're the same gender, because all these other factors will make an enormous difference. Um, so the first approach um, that we're going to talk about is this now we call the deficit model. And this is from a study written by an American called Robin Lakoff. It's a very long time ago, 1975, what we call the second wave feminism. So she was coming from a feminist perspective. Uh, she called it language and women's place. Um, and she was interested in why women weren't as strong or powerful in language and conversation as men. She only really talked about women's speech. She was, she was particularly interested in women's speech and sort of what women could do to be more powerful, I suppose. Uh, so she was focusing on those features that she believed made women's speech weaker and less authoritative than men's. She did also talk about Lexis um, and she suggested that women had more specialist vocabulary in certain areas. Uh, so what's distinctive about women's speech? These were the things she came up with. Um, so when she was thinking about Lexis, she suggested that women had a uh, broader vocabulary around the sort of work they had to do, housework in particular, and their interests, which she assumed were fashion and clothes. So words like shirt and a dart. I know what a dart is. I don't know what a shirt is, but I think they're both from clothes making. Um, she suggested women would have more precise colour terms because they talk a lot about colour. Uh, and she also identified what she called empty adjectives and said women use these a lot more than men. Now, given how long ago she wrote her study, some of these we don't use. No one uses anymore, like divine. Um, but if you think about words like lovely, cute, um, marvellous, well, marvellous, um, sweet, um, perhaps you would think those sound more like women than like men. Uh, and she also said women were more likely to use super polite forms, um, euphemisms and much weaker expletives than men. So something like poop um, and a euphemism for death, like passed away. Uh, but the main thing she was looking at was um, how women engage in conversation, how women talk when they're talking to other people. And the features that she identified, she said, weaken the strength of women's statements. So women, when they make a statement, they're not authoritative enough and they do these things that weaken what they say. So let's take an authoritative statement. Um, let me say English language is the best subject you can study at A level. OK, um, but if I said English language is sort of the best subject you can study at, English uh, at A level, you can see that weakens it. If I said English language is the best thing you could study at A level, isn't it? Yeah, does that make it sound like I'm asking for a bit of approval from you? Um, and if I said English language is the best subject you could study at A level with a rising intonation at the end, it makes it sound like a question. Um, she also mentioned the use of the intensifier so. It, and paradoxically, she said that makes what you're saying sound less strong because it's like you have to sort of boost it up. English language is so great. English language is so the best subject. <laughs> um, she also said that women use more emphatic stress. It's like they're speaking in italics. Well, interestingly, that one was proven, wasn't it, when we looked at what the phonological differences are between men and women. But I don't think that makes you weaker. Anyway, she, she was, that was her thesis, so she made it stick. Um, and she did say women used more hypercorrect grammar and more use of standard forms uh, compared to men, which would tie with Trudgill saying that women are more drawn to the prestige form. Now, I think that's where I'm going to stop today. Oh, yeah, let's just get to the criticisms. OK, so the criticisms of Lakoff, uh, well, calling it a deficit model, is a criticism, uh, basically saying women are rubbish. 
<laughs> or women's language is rubbish at least. So these are some of the arguments. Um, not all tag questions are weak. So just saying tag questions is a bit broad. Uh, they can be used in more powerful ways. So you'd have to be more specific about what or how women use tag questions that are weak. Um, yeah, what's the point of saying women have specialised Lexis here? Men may have more specialist Lexis there. Yeah, that's just um, it may be a difference between men's language and women's language if you can identify the interests, I suppose. But the biggest argument against her study is that most of the features she highlighted are found in powerless speech, regardless of gender. So um, some linguists did studies into how suspects uh, speak when the police are questioning them or how the accused speak when they're being questioned in the dock in court. And they found exactly these um, things that she was mentioning. So all she's found is that women don't have power, <laughs> which is what any feminist would suggest. So it's not specific to women. It's, it's generally people without power speak that way. And presumably the more women get powerful, the less they're going to use these things. So her work did demonstrate women use powerless language, but not anything specific about women's language. And despite her feminist intention, um, what she wrote can be used in a way to blame women for their lack of power. Yeah, it's tricky, this one, isn't it? It's always the question. If you say, oh, you know, this is really bad, uh, then, the, uh, then the thing is, oh, well, maybe you should do something to fix it. So women should be more assertive uh, and women should learn to talk like men, uh, like Margaret Thatcher with her lower pitched voice. Or women should learn to talk in this powerful way. OK, I'm going to stop there.